So welcome again, everybody, to this uh, second season, in this second day of the summer course on strengthening European identity through culture and education and how to manage it uh, within the, um, the block, the, the topic of the power of culture and memory strengthening European values. We come back um, again to Dimitar Nikolovsky, which is research fellow at uh, IAS and a PhD student at the Institute for Philosophy and Sociology of the Polish Academy of Science in, in Warsaw. Uh, in this second part, he has entitled his uh, speech, uh, Heritage, Development and Activism, Lessons from the European uh, Peripheries. He has a PowerPoint that uh, he just sent us. We are trying to download it, and it will be on as soon as we will get it. But uh, I think he's ready to start his uh, presentation. So the floor is all yours, Dimitar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to use my phone f until they solve this uh, this issue. So in my first talk, I was discussing mostly about, let's say, newer member states of the European Union and how we, they were dealing with the whole issue of European identity and European values and this conflict between the East and the West. Uh, but as I titled my second talk, about the European peripheries, I will tell you not two, but maybe one and a half story uh, from the European peripheries, uh, meaning uh, from two candidate member states uh, for, for the European Union. So from my country, where I'm coming from, Macedonia, uh, and from, uh, from Serbia. And uh, as I suppose many of you have seen in media lately, uh, Macedonia is going through uh, tremendous change, and it has a referendum on changing uh, the name of the country, uh, which is going to be this Sunday. And it has caused very serious uh, split uh, uh, in, within the country exactly on the question who we are and what our identity is. Uh, and as, as many uh, theories on identity uh, would, would tell you, that one of the ways of confirming your own identity is by uh, looking at the difference between your, you, yourself, and your negative other. And by negative other, I do not mean necessarily an enemy, but just someone who is different from you. So in the first question, when I, when I ask who are we about Macedonians, I will try to explain it through the negative others that the Macedonian nation is, uh, is using, or all the dichotomies that exist within this identification. So first of all, I will always use the word versus. Oh, you managed? Yeah. Oh, perfect, thanks. So I will always use the word versus. One dichotomy is Macedonian versus Bulgarian. And this is the, the eastern neighbor of, of the country, and those are two countries who have very serious conflicting national mythologies. So Macedonians in Macedonia would say that they are uh, a separate ethnic identity and they are a separate nation. However, the official uh, Bulgarian historiography and understanding of identity is that Macedonia or Macedonians and Macedonian history and culture and language are all subgroups of Bulgarian uh, identity. So they do not recognize the, uh, the distinctiveness of the Macedonian identity, and they think uh, or they believe that uh, the current Macedonian modern identity is just a product of uh, the communist elites from the 40s or, or in the years after uh, World War II. Second verses is the most important one now that we, uh, with, when, uh, with which I will finish uh, the talk, is this the versus Greek. So Macedonian versus Greek. Again, uh, Greece does not recognize the uh, identity of the Macedonian nation. They also see it as Bulgarians. And there is a specific clash between the two countries over the heritage of the ancient Macedonian uh, kingdom. And you know this Alexander and Philip uh, and, all of, and all of this. And I will outline this problem a little bit more uh, in, when we start with the slides. Another one is Slavic versus ancient. And there is a very serious split within the, the very ethnic Macedonian community 
uh, right now. It has been going on for at least in the last 11, 12 years very strongly. And this is, we are speaking a Slavic language. However, some people choose to identify more with the ancient Macedonian, with Alexander and Philip and the phalanx and all of that. And they think it's much more the important aspect of identity than the Slavic. Even though when we go out into the world and we meet other Slavs, specifically Southern Slavs, we understand each other completely. The, f the current folklore and everything is connected to Slavic identity. It's OK, perfect. Okay, so this. Uh -huh. Oh, okay, here? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, then it's also Orthodox or Eastern Christian and Muslim. Roughly, we, do not, we have not had a census since 2002, so we don't know the exact numbers, but roughly there's a, around 65% ethnic Macedonians, uh, maybe around 70 something percent. Uh, Orthodox Christians and 35 to 40 percent uh, uh, Sunni Muslims. So it's also one uh, one dichotomy within the country. The Muslims are usually uh, ethnic Albanian uh, or Turkish or Roma or Bosniak, uh, but there are also ethnic Macedonians who are Muslim. So there is also this uh, this dichotomy even within uh, the, the the ethnic community. Then another versus is. As I mentioned, the Albanians, there was a conflict in 2001 in which the ethnic Albanian community uh, had an uprising and they asked for more linguistic rights, more recognition, uh, etc. And this is a, a problem that is always present uh, when you need to form a government, for example, uh, or about relations between young people. There are positive examples of cooperation, but many, many, many negative examples of uh, pure uh, animosity. Then it's Macedonian versus the borders. And this is not a distinctly Macedonian issue. I would say it's Balkan and very connected to Central Europe. And this is the imagination of uh, uh, national or nationalist elites that they are bordering themselves. So everyone in the Balkans feels that the uh, history has done them wrong that they're actually rightfully much bigger than they actually are. So in the Macedonian nationalist um, imagination, there is a part of Bulgarian that is actually Macedonian. And of course, there is part of, uh, of uh, Greece that is actually Macedonia, where ethnic Macedonians live, something which the neighboring countries deny. Finally, and this is the most crucial one that I will go back to, is versus Europe and how European we are, how much European we really want to be, and most importantly, what is the price we want to pay in order to be European. So to continue in this note, oh, okay. yeah, I will speak a little bit about the Macedonian name issue between uh, Greece and Macedonia. Uh, so uh, Greece, uh, when the country became independent uh, after the dissolution of Yugoslavia, uh, Greece was upset because of the usage of the name Macedonia, uh, several clauses in the constitution of the country, and because of its flag. And you can see uh, the old flag on your left. Uh, so it claimed that it had irredentist ambitions on the Greek Aegean Macedonian province. So it closed the border in 1991 and imposed, imposed an oil embargo, which crippled the, you know, anyways struggling Macedonian economy. The in, there was an interim accord between these two countries. The, the flag was changed and uh, necessarily to mention that this, this uh, is a flag that was found on some shields in uh, current Greece that was used as shields of the uh, armies of Alexander. So for, uh, for Macedonians, especially in the late 20th century, this was the ultimate national symbol. However, in order to appease uh, the uh, requests of the more powerful and more established southern neighbor, it, they did a modified version of, of, of this flag, which is the current flag of the country. 
So in, in 1995, uh, changed the flag. Uh, there is also this interim uh, uh, accord. And the two countries agreed that within the auspices of the UN, they will negotiate on the differences of the, uh, uh, of the, of the name. So in 1992, there were very serious, very big Greek demonstrations in Athens uh, against the recognition of Macedonia. More than a million people uh, participated. Uh, the UN Security Council sent a peacekeeping force in light of all the wars that were happening in Yugoslavia at the time. In 1993, uh, it was, uh, the country was admitted under the provisional name, which, was, which is still officially the name in all uh, international organization, the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. And as we will see uh, uh, in shortly, the two countries have agreed upon in the last few months on a name change. But in order to go back to the identity issue, I will uh, just draw the attention, I always make this mistake, on a very serious national defeat that happened, or at least it was interpreted as a national defeat in 2008, when Macedonia was expecting to be, or was promised to be uh, accepted as a member of NATO, but Greece vetoed this decision. And that was a very serious strategic uh, um, decision of every elite since the independence. So some of these, uh, um, Headlines in world media is NATO, Macedonia, veto Stokes tension. Jilted Macedonia walks out of NATO summit for Macedonia. NATO summit, a disappointment. And so this defeat by the government at the time uh, caused a serious blow. Also, the economy was not so good at the time. So what they had to do in order to keep loyalty of voters, they... Uh, went to a process called the antiquization. And probably many of you are familiar with this process. So the Renaissance practice of giving a city the appearance of ancient Rome or Athens, which was visible in and after the 15th century in Italy and all over, all over Europe. So this is the, more or less the appearance of what Skopje, the capital of the country, used to be. Uh, the, the city had a very serious earthquake in 1963. It was almost completely destroyed. And it was a sign of world solidarity that the whole world really helped rebuild, uh, the, rebuild the city. The project of, uh, of the city was done by a famous um, Japanese uh, architect Kenzo Tange. And as you can see, there is a lot of brutalist uh, architecture, um, uh, which is uh, typical for communist states. But also, the, uh, the center of the city had a lot of open spaces. However, the new hope of the reified national identity was the project called the Skopje 2014. So now is the video. Can we, can we play it? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Here, uh, this is a monument for the fallen heroes of Macedonia. This is the parliament with more horsemen in front of it and national heroes. This is the square and it says new facades of the, of the buildings on the square. 
This is a triumphal arc called uh, Port Macedonia, so looking like something like from Paris. The monument of the defenders of the country are veterans from the conflict in 2001. A new church being built on the uh, on the main square where this closed space was, or open space was, sorry. So new uh, new building instead of the old uh, bank. Monument of King, uh, Tsar Samuel, who is like a contentious figure for Bulgaria, Bulgaria sees him as Bulgarian uh, uh, emperor, fountain, and this is Alexander the Great. So this is the first president uh, in the communist times. Hotel Marriott. So this was green area before. Another hotel on the square. Justinian the first, who was supposedly born in Skopje. These were also revolutionaries against the Ottoman Empire. More revolutionaries. Saint Clement and Naum, and Cyril and Methodius, so the inventors of the Cyrillic alphabet. monuments. This is like a court, state archive, the archaeological museum. So this was never there. It was either older buildings or uh, agency for electronic communications. Okay, I think I'm, I'm good with it. Yeah, I can go back. Yes. So you can see the style it was built in and that it rec uh, commemorates the glorious past uh, so it's a combination of uh, commemorating heroes against the Ottoman Empire, but also this ancient Macedonian heritage. And this project was this project was called by the former foreign ministry as a big middle finger to Greece, which costed around more than half a billion euros. And this is how the uh, new square looks like at the moment with everything that's been built. It's probably some uh, protest or something uh, happening in this picture. And here you can see the construction of Alexander the Great. Who was not named Alexander the Great? By the way, it was named Warrior on the Horse for reasons we do not know why, but it's obvious uh, who it is. When it was being erected, it's around 17 meters or so, when it was being erected, uh, citizens spontaneously gathered in front of the monument and started singing the national anthem, which is obviously a song that <laughs> was written in the 50s and does, does uh, not have any reference to this ancient Macedonian uh, past. On the other side of the river, you have also the royal family. So you have Olympia, the mother of Alexander, and you have the father, uh, Philip, so greeting the son from across the river. 
And to watch over them, you also have lions, like the ancient Macedonian symbol, and also Bucephalus, the, uh, the horse of Alexander. And these are some of the buildings that I showed you from the projection, and this is how they look like. So you have the triumphal arc, Port Macedonia, where all the victories of the nation are going to be celebrated. You have uh, the archaeological museum, the court, and in the lower left corner, that's a garage. <laughs> and you start from this very grand project of reinvention of heritage. You also start uh, um, internalizing some other popular pra practices. So as you can see, for sports events, the phalanx was, uh, w was used. So this was the army of Alexander the Great. You see football fans being dressed like this, usage of the old uh, flag of the, uh, of the sun, uh, also usage of uh, in, or, uh, combination of a revolutionary flag from uh, the, this, uh, the lion from against the Ottoman Empire. But also, they, did, they went even further. So legend says that when Alexander went to conquer India, some of his armies stayed in Pakistan. So what this government did is actually went and found the, our distant relatives who have Alexandric uh, mythology of their own. And these are the tribes called Hunza uh, and um, Kalash in Pakistan. And they brought, they waited for them at the airport with people dressed like this. Uh, so these were the royal family of these tribes, and they met the prime minister, etc. And they were even given public land to build the summer villa. Ah, needless to say, when this Macedonian uh, expedition went in, in Pakistan in the Himalayas, there was already a Greek cultural center there. So <laughs> we are not the worst. Uh, and other representations, you see little kids being dressed as the army of Alexander. And up until recently, you could visit the square and you could take pictures with some sort of animators, uh, of, uh, animators on, on, on the square. It even entered the religion or the Orthodox Church. So even though this was way before Christianity, all of this symbology, and even though uh, this uh, ancient Macedonian ki kingdom was uh, you know, a pagan kingdom, etc., still you see the, the head of the church having the flag, and you see this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, sons within, built within new churches. So complete transformation of, of identity through, through, through building and through uh, in, in this invention of uh, new heritage. This obviously produced some resistance, and I think one of the topics here is citizenship, so that's why I wanted to tell this story, that not everyone liked it. So the first signs of uh, uh, resistance uh, were was the so-called architectonic uprising in 2009 when this project was announced, and primarily it was about building of this church that actually didn't get built. First, it was supposed to be a church on the square, but now it's only Alexander on the square, and the church had been moved uh, several hundred meters to the side. Uh, so the motto of this uh, protesters was don't rape Skopje. However, how it was interpreted by some government mouthpieces was Tomorrow at 12 o'clock on the square in Skopje, a gang of gays and atheists will most likely attempt to spread infamous under the pretense of caring for city architecture and will oppose the church. I and my family will participate in the counter protest organized an hour earlier to express our support for having this church. So this was uh, done by uh, TV uh, host, a uh, very popular one at the time. So in 2001, uh, uh, nine, uh, before local elections, and this protest was violently interrupted by the very counter-protest uh, that was called uh, by this uh, uh, TV host. You can see some of the pictures up, up on the left. You can see this uh, students of architecture 
so saying just simply don't rape Skopje. On the other side, you see people with uh, religious and nationalist insignia. And there was some you know, shouting at each other. One group yelled Macedonia, Macedonia, and the other group also yelled Macedonia, Macedonia. <laughs> But then they would, like the, 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 the Christians or this right-wing group would start insulting them, saying, you are Albanians, filthy Albanians, you're not one of us. So going back to the stories from, the, from this morning, who is us, who are we, who are the real people, and who are the other people? So those people who opposed this project were the others. They were not pure Macedonia, they might be Muslim, and definitely uh, traitors. And then there was a fight. Basically, the students were, uh, were attacked by uh, the counter-protesters. Another more, much more significant uh, point of con uh, sorry, episode of contention and uh, a sign of resistance was the so-called colorful revolution. And it should not be considered a color revolution as we see in uh, Ukraine, as we saw in Serbia, uh, etc. But it was colorful only because of the usage of various colors. So against this previous government now, there were many cases of, uh, of resistance for various issues, police brutality, uh, rising prices of energy, etc. But no, uh, none of these uh, issues drew such big masses as the colorful revolution, which was the uh, culmination of all previous uh, points of resistance. Uh, so uh, it, was, uh, it was initiated by a decision of the president, still the same president. Uh, he gave a blanket a pardon to all politicians who have done any crimes or who have been con uh, suspected of crime or corruption. People exited, and after a few days of protest, this is how they came up. This is not an original repertoire of action. We have seen the same in France. We have seen the same in Bosnia, for example. But what, uh, what was done is that they were going to the streets. Yeah, so you see all of these buildings, and uh, uh, they were defaced uh, by, by, by the protesters. So they would be going in the street, fill water balloons uh, or uh, just water guns uh, with colors, trying to express uh, their anger, not only at this disruption of public space and redefinition of identity, but also because it involved a lot of corruption while building, and we still don't know exactly how much this project costed. So by doing this, they said, this is not us. We are not represented by this architecture. And what is interesting that even now, many of them have been cleaned, but also for example, the court has not been cleaned and it's intentionally left like that to, to stay as a remainder of, uh, of uh, these times. This colorful revolution brought about the change of the government. And, uh, and this new government promised to solve all these big national issues. So besides fighting corruption and all of that, they actually made or used the historical moment to make an agreement with Greece, with the government of Syriza and uh, Tsipras. And this, and this agreement, signed in July, is um, in a very short uh, you know, few points. They agreed that they will change the name of the country from Republic of Macedonia uh, to Republic of North Macedonia, so to make, in order to make a difference between the Greek region of Macedonia and the country of Macedonia, for all purposes, so both international organizations and, and at home, which also brings changes in the constitution. And that is obviously people who were happy about the building of those monuments before are not happy about this agreement now. And now the country is more or less split 50-50. And we have a referendum, as I mentioned, this Sunday, between two. There is no pro and against. There is pro and boycott. So the 
probably there will be very few people who go out and they will vote against this referendum. They will still simply stay home because of several issues, but most importantly, it's because the list of voters is not clean, so there's still a lot of dead people, a lot of people who, are, uh, who live uh, abroad and they're not interested, so you cannot really know how many people are against. But if you, put, if you boycott, you put every, all of those people on your side. And the main slogan of the four uh, campaign is for European Macedonia. The main slogan of the boycott campaign is never north, only Macedonia. So you see where, where this uh, trip that I took you on took uh, the people uh, of the country is that now the price for entering the European Union and entering NATO is changing the name of the country. And for those people who, who see themselves as Europeans, it's a no-brainer and they are willing to go uh, with, with uh, this change. However, for the others, who also might claim declaratively that they are also European, they also want to be part of Europe, even though among those are also very pro-Russian groups uh, and, and the similar. But for them, changing the name of the country is too big of a price to pay in order to become uh, European. So this is, this is my, my, my take or, uh, uh, on, on this uh, identity issue uh, in, in the country. And also, this, it coincides the pro-Europeans with this whole, we are Slavic, we are not ancient people, whereas the other one saying we have a glorious past, Europe should bound to us, not we to Europe. Uh, now, okay, I think I will have some extra time. I will go to another example about development and about uh, identity and activism. And we are moving a little bit north into Serbia. And this is this campaign called Don't Let Belgrade Down or Drown. In Serbian, it's Nedamo or Nedavimo Beograd, which was a grassroots movement initiated by this very humongous project called Belgrade Water for, uh, Waterfront Project, uh, which was the urbanization of the part of the Danube bank, uh, bank used, some of it used for railways, and uh, some of it is called uh, Sava Mala, uh, which, was a, which is a kind of a newly discovered hip neighborhood. Uh, and it is um, uh, invested 68% uh, uh, by uh, a company from the European, uh, United um, Arab Emirates, and the Republic of Serbia. So it's both public and, uh, and, and private uh, foreign, uh, foreign investment. You can see like on the map at least how big this is. And this is building new buildings, hotel, hotels, commercial, um, commercial spaces, uh, uh, like uh, walking lanes. And this is only one kilometer away from uh, the historic center of the city. And it's also encroaching on some uh, old neighborhoods or places where, uh, uh, where Roma lives. So they, they, they thought that it would be too easy to just kick out the Roma to the, uh, to, to the margins of, uh, of the city. Now the initial dissent against this project was because it was, an, it was too big to be announced without referendum or at least uh, public, uh, public discussion. It was a privatization of an extensive part of uh, public space, which was, uh, some of it was populated by uh, Roma. There were like storage uh, 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 magazines and, uh, uh, and there was, I would call it a mild gentrification and this was this uh, uh, Sava Mala. So there, uh, in uh, old empty warehouses emerged some alternative spaces, uh, uh, nightclubs, uh, artistic ateliers, and it should be done uh, in, within uh, 30 years. Many unclear points about uh, the financing of the stages and duration of the project itself, and also that it is uh, aesthetically intrusive project, at least those, that is what the, the criticism uh, was. 
Now this is me just sucking up to our director, Steve Austin. Here in Serbian language, it's written Steve Austin, and there is actually a bar in a cultural center in this neighborhood called Steve Austin for uh, respecting him for what uh, he had done for the transformation of this space. Now, the, it, this cultural center itself, to my best of knowledge, is not in danger of being demolished, but its surroundings will be completely transformed into really high buildings, so it will look completely differently. Then the first protest happened in April of 2015, not big, around 200 uh, citizens. And the trademark, the, uh, the main symbol of this uh, protest was a yellow duck. And this is like a slang for penis duck in, in Serbian language. So give them a duck to those who want to transform our, our city uh, so much. So there were some sporadic initiatives, one then, and more protests with more than uh, 200 protestants. Something that I failed to mention before, which I wanted to uh, connect to, uh, to, to theory, is that the intention of the government who, is inv who invested and who came up with the project and sought for investors from abroad was something that Serbian uh, sociologist Marina Simic called the cosmopolitan yearning of the Serbs. Uh, she, do, uh, she did research with young people in the early 2000s. Uh, so it was uh, the bad reputation that Serbia had during the wars of the 90s was some kind of, in a way, internalized by young Serbs. And they were always looking to be cosmopolitan and to represent themselves to the world as being part of the world. In uh, 97, there were huge student demonstrations where the slogan was, Belgrade is the world. And this government thought that this is one way, besides obviously making good pro uh, profit, to present Serbia as this cos uh, or Belgrade as this very big cosmopolitan uh, city that is part of the trends in the world. However, an incident happened in 25th of April 2016 when already people were complaining about the demolishing of some buildings and also some traditional restaurants that had been favorite. Uh, with the old uh, 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 Serbian or sorry Belgrade uh, 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 crowd, so masked people with bulldozers demolished part of this Sava Mala that I mentioned. So they took random people who happened to be on the spot as hosti hostages until they finished. It, police didn't react. The government stayed mute. Uh, no one took responsibility. One of the hostages even died afterwards of, ha uh, of a heart attack. And this is what gave birth to this don't let Belgrade drown or down uh, movement. What happened? Oh. OK. And the slogan came. Duck for the cheaters, so duck, remember, it's penis, city for, for everyone. So it became part of uh, one of these movements, the right to city, that we have seen in so many other places around Europe. So from 5,000 to 20,000 pr protest, uh, Prime Minister admitted that the city government stands behind the demolition, but no one was held accountable. No, uh, you know, no, no one resigned from their uh, position. And they had certain demands uh, that uh, well, it's, the initiative consisted of individuals and organizations that have previously been involved with advocacy against privatization of public space. Uh, so it was done in the uh, social networks that this might not pass. They uh, named specific people that need to resign because of uh, this. Uh, now it's asking for resignations, but it turned into independent, like a group of um, voters who are coming with, uh, uh, with independent lists for the local elections, uh, the latest elections in Serbia, but uh, without success. Um, so I showed you these two examples about identity, uh, trying to be European, trying to be uh, cosmopolitan and Western, but going into different directions, right? In Macedonia, they went to the past 
in Serbia, they went uh, to the future, but they were done in such intrusive ways, uh, not, not typical for the, uh, the spaces, without much consent of the general public, that they produced this, uh, this, uh, 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 this resistance and these movements. For Macedonia, this proved successful in terms of overturning the government, uh, but for Serbia, this has not happened. Okay, I think I'll stop here. And um, yeah, hopefully in the debate, uh, you will give me similar examples to what you saw now. That's my message. Thanks. I don't know where is the micro, but anyway, well, I can come here. Okay. We thank you uh, for your presentation and um, give you, giving us this uh, vision and, and all this information on these two specific places in, in Central Europe and also uh, raising awareness uh, us about uh, what is going on mm -hmm. over there. Well, uh, I follow a little bit the theme of uh, Belgrado, uh, Santana Go, but uh, I think right now the, um, the focus is put on Macedonia because of this uh, referendum is, is happening. And just yesterday, and I was looking, when you just were about to finish, I was looking for some news I, I read yesterday about the, um, the well, uh, they were trying to jeopardize the referendum, uh, and the, um, the president said that he's not going to to vote, he's not going to participate on it. And uh, well, I think it's a, a hot topic for all uh, all of us. It's not only it's not only for Macedonia, it's not only for Greece, but it's also for for Europe. But because it looks that uh, they have like a kind of agreement, but uh, right now the thing is uh, in danger. I mean that, that that agreement, not everybody agreed on that, but they decide to um, to produce this referendum. And uh, well, uh, they are putting themselves in a po clear position to to jeopardize uh, this referendum. And uh, it, it was quite amazing uh, to see how they transform the city to give this appearance of uh, all uh, memory and all history. And, and so on. And I can understand that uh, those protests that uh, uh, were happening, but uh, in some ways, uh, kind of creating a very um, artificial uh, memory of uh, what is the. So, um, but at a very big level, because, uh, well, normally when we try to, to uh, influence now people, we use the social media, we try to use more like uh, information. But that was much more uh, uh, bigger. So, how can really people uh, stand that in, uh, in like in Macedonia? And do you think that uh, with this position, because in, in the title of, of, of uh, your, your your speech, I don't have the, the paper right now, but um, um, it was like a, a development and activism. yeah, but there was like a vision, a concept, uh, your concept, your vision, which is your your real vision or concept on, on that. And it is, it is really true that uh, this uh, question of the name can jeopardize the whole relations between Greece and Macedonia, and therefore uh, the role of Macedonia in the European Union in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And someone looked? Uh, sure. should, should I yeah. answer or wait for someone? Yeah, 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 you can, you can answer. And Thank, thank you, Miguel, for this uh, reflection. Um, well, I, it's, it's not that I don't understand exactly the people who decided to do this transformation, you know, be, because they, they were riding on this wave of uh, disappointment of this endangered identity. As I mentioned in the beginning, you know, this idea that the identity of Macedonia is tackled from all sides, uh, all sides. So it was not difficult to, to, to uh, convince people that this is a good idea, uh, even though it is a creation of an art artificial uh, memory. Uh, 
However, when we see, when, when you look, look at the name issue exactly in this, uh, in this agreement, the two countries, in my opinion, set up a very good example on how you can resolve an issue, a problem, peacefully through diplomacy. It was sponsored and supported by the European Union and by the US, all Western powers. But that is the main, uh, uh, the main result that we should take from, from this whole uh, process. People who are against this uh, solution or, against, or who are uh, for the boycott of the referendum, they failed to see, to, to, to offer another vision. So this referendum in my, or the success of this referendum uh, and the closing of this very serious issue at least holds the promise. It does not hold the guarantee of Macedonian integration into the European Union, but it opens the door a little bit more and holds the promise. The closing of this issue and saying, no, we are not going to agree, we will wait for some better times, uh, simply is stalling, and I think it will bring about even more regression of democracy in the country, especially considering the guarantees that are coming from Greece, because in the, new, in the next year's elections, this government most probably will not win. And if there would be a referendum in Greece, there is no virtual chance of supporting this agreement. So there might, so the only hope for popular support would come from Macedonia, from those who make most of the concessions. Okay, so we have a very difficult future <laughs> <laughs> right now. So questions from the floor, comments? You already had the coffee, no? <laughs> Maybe it's such a distant thing from... Well, they are very um, specific topics. Maybe, maybe that is true that the, we didn't have so far that discussion about that problem at the European level. It was more maybe a regional discussion, mm -hmm. and it was discussed also in Brussels. I mean, that is a problem because uh, we didn't bring this topic to the, I mean, to the, um, let's say, national arena or regional arena in the rest of the European countries. It's not a topic we talk about because we don't feel like if it is a problem from all of us, mm -hmm. which I think also is a, a mistake because at the end it's affecting all of us because this is producing that there is no real agreement between two countries and there is no real agreement uh, with the European Union because they cannot go on mm -hmm. and some countries are trying to, to let's say, uh, step um, uh, far away from there or they, they don't support that because they, they, they are also scared that something like that happen in, in their countries. I mean, we are in Spain, we are living this, this now these days with these Catalonia things, independence. So uh, I know that is the, this problem. Uh, I just remember what uh, I wanted to ask you, you before because I lost my, my papers, but uh, in, your, in your presentation, um, the title was Lessons from the European Peripheries. Mm -hmm. Which are your lessons? Because you, you saw the case, but which is the lesson you want to show to us? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the lesson was simply about the citizenship aspect, actually, of it. And this res resistance only uh, for the rest of my points were just hopefully to give a better uh, context and uh, maybe open a discussion. But uh, this, the, the, the lesson is this, that uh, citizens can be very creative in, ex in expressing their dissatisfaction. Uh, sometimes they need helps from, uh, help from friends from abroad, as it did happen, with, especially in the Macedonian case, and they can be successful. I mean, you cannot uh, you know, completely destroy the Skopje 2014 project, even though there are such suggestions. Mm -hmm. To completely dismantle it or to give away all these monuments to neighboring countries or neighboring cities, it might not be so bad. Uh, but never, nevertheless, uh, this, uh, this intrusion into public space and into identity produced uh, such big dissatisfaction uh, that actually they managed to bring down an otherwise illib illiberal government. Okay, so maybe we can finish with this uh, lesson. And uh, we take good note, hopefully you also take good note of uh, how we can change the things as citizens, as, 
and civil society. So thank you very much, Dimitar, for this your presentation, and uh, we'll keep discussing with you during these days. Thank you very much. A big clap to him.